Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Our theme for worship this morning is Faithful Watchmen. God has given us his word, his law, and his gospel, and he expects us to use it. It's not something that we like doing. It's not something that we like having done to us. But as we're going to see in our lessons today, God clearly says we are to use that law to show people their sins. And it's not, it's not judging them based on some, some personal ideas. It's showing people what God's word says about words and actions. God wants us to use that law, but he also wants us to use that gospel that shows that Christ has taken care of those sins. So that's going to be our our theme for worship this morning. Um, The order of service we're using is service of word and sacrament, page 26 in your your, uh, bullet, uh, your hymnals. Feel free to use the hymnals if you want. Um, Otherwise, everything is printed in here for you to use, including the hymns. We'll begin by singing our opening hymn this morning, hymn 532. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. 
Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. As we turn to our scripture readings for this morning, our first lesson is recorded in Ezekiel chapter 33. We begin reading at verse 7. But I have appointed you, son of man, to be a watchman for the house of Israel. So whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you are to warn them from me. When I say to a wicked man, wicked man, you shall surely die, If you do not speak to warn the wicked man against his way, that wicked man will die because of his guilt. But I will also hold you responsible for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his way and he does not turn from his way, he will die because of his guilt, but you will have saved your life. 
So, you, son of man, say the following to the house of Israel. This is what you people are saying. Certainly our rebellion and our sins weigh us down, and because of them we are rotting away. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from their way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? This is the word of our God. Our psalm of the day this morning is Psalm 51a. Our second lesson for this morning is from Romans chapter 13. We begin reading at verse 1. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for no authority exists except by God. And the authorities that do exist have been established by God. Therefore, the one who rebels against the authority is opposing God's institution, and those who oppose will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to evil. Would you like to have no fear from the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will receive praise from him, because he is God's servant for your benefit. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because he does not carry the sword without reason. He is God's servant, a punisher to bring wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For this reason you also pay taxes, because the authorities are God's ministers, who are employed to do this very thing. Pay what you owe to all of them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. 
for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And if there is any other commandment, they're summed up in this statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, so love is the fulfillment of the law. This is the word of our God. Our verse of the day, Alleluia, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of our gospel. Our gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 18. We begin reading at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as an unbeliever or a tax collector. Amen. I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. I tell you again, if two of you on earth agree to ask for anything, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. In fact... Where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am among them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We'll continue with our hymn of the day, hymn 521. Thank you. 
I don't spend a whole lot of time watching TV, and I spend even less time trying to watch commercials. But there was one commercial a few years ago that sticks in my mind. It showed a man sitting on this shiny, beautiful new lawn tractor in his perfect, weed-free, beautifully landscaped lawn with a nice, spacious white house in the background. And the narrator for the commercial is explaining how this man has it all. And when the narrator asks the man how he's able to afford it, the guy on the lawnmower plasters this smile on his face and said, I'm up to my debt and my eyeballs. Somebody please help me. In our, in our nation of excess and pursuing the American dream, it's easy, very easy to get up to our eyeballs in debt, and it can be very hard to dig our way out of it again. In fact, people and businesses get so swamped in debt that they, to file for bankruptcy is a normal thing. Between, between credit cards and car payments and mortgages, the average personal debt of Americans as of the end of 20, uh, 2019 was over $90,000 per person. That's, that's a lot of money. And for better or for worse, it seems to be the norm to be in debt by a lot. Like everyone else, Christians have debts too. And as God's people, we will see to it that we pay our loans and debts in full. It's God's will that we let no debt remain outstanding, as Paul says. But there's one debt we will never be able to pay off completely, and that is the continuing debt of love to one another. And in this sense, Christians are always in debt. One of the hardest things for a person to realize is that everything that we have comes from a loving God. Our body, our souls, our eyes, ears, and all our members, our mind, and all our abilities, as Luther put it, right? We, we breathe his air, we eat his food, we walk on his planet, we enjoy his beautiful sunsets that he puts in the sky. We marvel at his handiwork. It all belongs to him, and as Luther sums up in his explanation to the first article of the Apostles' Creed, for all this I ought to thank and praise to serve and obey him. Well, the reason it's so hard for us to realize this truth is that sin has changed us so completely by nature. That by nature, we don't know who our loving God is. In fact, by nature, we assume that everything, that life, is all about me. And anyone who thinks differently is my enemy. So instead of entering the world singing praises to our great and loving provider God, we enter the world shaking our fist at him. How, how dare he tell me what to do with my life, what to believe with my life. And this inborn rebellion, it puts us deeply in debt to God, even before we're born. And not just up to our eyeballs, but way in over our head. And this is the, the next hardest thing for a person to realize. We are drowning in debt to God's eternal justice. And we don't have anything to offer to pay it off. So like the guy on that lawnmower, going through life blissfully pretend, we, we, we go through life blissfully pretending that we're living out our dreams, trying to smile the guilt away, and in the meantime going deeper and deeper into spiritual debt every day. In, in the heart, people sense that a day of reckoning is coming. We recognize that there's no escaping death and what comes after it. But we're helpless to change the situation on our own. We need somebody to help us. You and I need somebody to help us. And that last hardest thing for us to realize is that our loving God has had mercy on us. He sent his son to pay off our debt for us. Our nature wants to try to keep on paying that off, to keep on doing good to our neighbor by insisting other people do good. But we can't pay it off. God charged our entire debt to Jesus instead of counting against us. Jesus paid that debt we owe to God by suffering for us, by dying for us on his cross. And as John writes in his first letter, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. There's not a little bit left. If somebody knocked on your door and told you to gather up all of your debts, all of your bills, total them up, and then you, he gave you a check to pay them off in full, at the very least, you'd jump up and down for joy. Even in a day of social distancing, you might just have to give them a hug, right? 
those earthly debts and bills, they are absolutely nothing compared to having your eternal debt, the debt in hell, wiped clean from your record, giving you a perfect, a perfect life in God's sight. So how do we hug God? How do we jump for joy? We owe him our life, but there's no way that we can ever repay him. So what do you do when someone loves you so much? Well, the answer is you love them back. Through the Apostle Paul this morning, the Lord put it this way. Jesus died for all that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And as we sing in one of our hymns, Here, Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. We owe everything to our God. And he wants us to pay it off by paying it to our neighbor. Luther began the explanation to all of his, uh, his explanations to the Ten Commandments with the phrase, we should fear and love God that we. In other words, we owe it to God to obey him with heartfelt respect and with genuine love. If you think back to your catechism day, he starts off the, the first three commandments. He shows us, God shows us how to express our love for him by honoring his place in our hearts, by not misusing his name, by hearing and learning his word. Those first three commandments deal with our love for God. In the other seven commandments, God teaches us to express our love and thanks for him by loving our neighbor, whom he also loves. In fact, to, all, to love others as much as we love ourselves. So that doesn't leave us, it doesn't allow us to say things like, well, of course I love God because he's my creator and savior, but my neighbor is another story. Right? Love isn't a, a line item veto where we can decide who we love and who we get to scratch off our list. Love is supposed to be a blanket that covers everyone. Through John, God reminds us that anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And the Greek word that the Holy Spirit chose to use in all these passages is that, that agape love, the love of total, unconditional, undeserved treatment. In one area where that word love might not come to mind is when it comes to, uh, to our government. God says we are to love our, our president, our governor, our legislators, our police officers. They are our neighbor, too, right? As God commands us through Paul's pen, their authority over us is God-given. And that includes them in the fourth commandment. Martin Luther summed up God's will for us this way. He said, we should fear and love God that we do not dishonor our anger, our parents, or others in authority, but honor, serve, obey them, and give them love and respect. And the thought comes into our minds, well, that would be a lot easier if we didn't have the people in government we have today, right? We might want to consider that, reconsider that line of thought. When the Holy Spirit had Paul write these words to us in Romans, the Christians in Rome, the, for the Christians in Rome, the governing authorities included the cruel and ruthless Roman Caesar Nero. And if you know anything about Nero, you have to ask her, how do you love a guy like that? This is the guy who, for his parties, would light Christians on fire. So how do you love a guy like that? Well, you love him the same way Jesus loved him. The same way Jesus loves you. By seeing a soul who needs Jesus' forgiveness and he needs your prayers. In a representative government like we have in the United States, it's all too natural to complain about our government. But as we look around at other countries in the world, we realize that we are blessed to have the government that we have. In spite of its many glaring weaknesses, we pay our debt of love to God by loving the government he has given us as God's servants who give their full time to governing. We pay off our debt of love to God as we give everyone what you owe. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, than honor. And we can bring that closer to home as well, to the neighbor who lives close to us, whether it's the neighbor who lives in our, in our town or our neighborhood, the neighbor who sits in the pew next to us, or the person, the neighbor that lives in the same house that we live in. It's easy to love people who love us or at least appreciate it when they show love to them. But think about the people who are reading this letter that Paul wrote. 
The Christians in Rome lived in communities that persecuted and slandered and ridiculed those who followed that Jewish slave Jesus who was nailed to a cross like a criminal. Some of those neighbors would be sitting in the Colosseum grandstands and cheer as their Christian neighbors were torn to shred by lions. How do you love people who do things like that to you? Again, the same way that Jesus loved them. In the same way that Jesus loves us. Because no matter who you are, everybody is born with sin. Everybody is born an enemy to God and to his word. And we should expect that even our fellow church members will, at times will sin against us. In fact, we should be surprised and glorify Jesus when everybody is kind and loving. But you and I are very quick to turn off our love when others fail to measure up to our expectations. And we, short, we fall short of fulfilling God's law of selfless love for others. Only Jesus' perfect love could fulfill the law. He perfectly loved others as he loved himself. He never wished for their harm. He, never, he completely filled that law. He did it perfectly for us by loving God, by loving his neighbor. So we bring to Jesus our imperfect, our stumbling love for forgiveness. And he reminds, he reminds us again and again that he has paid that debt of our sin in full. Even our sins of self-centeredness, our sins of lovelessness. So how does a Christian respond? By returning our thanks and joy with a continuing debt of love to others. Jesus is why we have a smile on our face. No matter what your lawn looks like or what condition your house may be in or what your bank account looks like. Friends, you, you have it all. Your eternal debt of sin has been paid completely. You have an inheritance in heaven that can never perish, it can never spoil, it can never fade. You can smile because somebody has already helped you with your debt. And now our response as Christians is to help others, to, to help others through yourself, through your actions, through your words. Right? Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. If your love is being shared and it's shining, even in the face of persecution, others will see that faith in action. They'll be drawn to ask you for the reason for the hope that you have. Share your reason for smiling. Tell people how, paid, how Jesus paid their complete debt to sin. Show them his kindness, his compassion. For what Jesus did for us, this is the love debt that we owe and God wants us to pay it to our neighbor and it's one that we'll never finish paying off. There always will be a need for God's love for every single one of us. And because that love comes from God and flows through us, we always have enough to share. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding, let it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find it printed on page 12. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cry, hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies that you pour down on us anew each day. We thank you for the gifts of your mighty providence. Make us mindful, O Lord, that you have provided us with life, breath, and being and are the source of our daily bread. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may produce the fruits of righteousness. May he endow us with unwavering faith that we might always be ready to do your will. We pray for the nations of the earth. Subdue terror and tyranny everywhere and call forth leaders who acknowledge that you are Lord over all the earth. Bless our own land. Make it ever follow that which is good and turn from all that which is wicked, that our people may prosper in uprightness and integrity. Hear, O Lord, our cry for those who are afflicted. Grant them health in body and soul and save them for your mercy's sake. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Guide and uphold us during our pilgrimage in this world and bring us all to our heavenly home. Receive these petitions in the name of the Prince of Life, Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He made his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. You are at peace with your God. Your sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue on the single insert. If you didn't find that, I messed up on the printing. We continue on, on this sheet. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Please be seated. We'll close with our final hymn.
Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Um, the one thing I want to announce, um, we've got our Adopted Highway coming up next Saturday. Um, if you're able to be there for that, it's a really nice walk. Um, it usually takes an hour or so. We start south half of Yale all the way down through the bank or so and back. Again, it takes an hour or so. Um, if you can help out with that, please talk to John. And John would like to address you. Do you want the microphone? 